Welcome back to the Educated Home Buyer, where we discuss everything you need to know to buy right, borrow smart, and build wealth through real estate ownership and financing. So far, we've discussed everything from why you should own a home to why home prices are so high at the moment. But one thing we haven't touched on is how much it costs to buy a home with regards to closing costs. Josh and I often talk to home buyers who aren't familiar with cost when buying a home. They're familiar with the down payment side of things, but they don't realize they need additional money in order to purchase a home. So Josh and I want to dive into closing costs today in order to help you become the educated home buyer. So Josh, where do we start with this topic? One of the most important pieces of the puzzle is the money involved in that process. So let's talk about it. In another episode, we had talked about you know the reason why a pre-approval is important and what does a pre-approval look like um, to a consumer, to a potential home buyer such as yourself. Um, the pre-approval comes down to just some certainty on a few things: how much money do I need, how much do I qualify for, and what does my monthly payment look like? So today we're going to go deep dive on what does how much. Uh, what does it look like to answer the question, how much do I need at closing? So down payment's pretty easy. Most clients will come to me saying, hey, I want to do 3% down. I want to do 5% down. Or maybe they say, I have $50,000 to put down. But a lot of times that means they have $50,000 total. So we have to back out what closing costs are, what prepaids are, what the total amount is you're going to need to bring in at closing and what you have available. So when we look at that, let's start with closing costs. These are also known as non-recurring closing costs. They're the things that you pay at closing that are not going to repeat. You're paying them as part of buying the home and or getting the loan. So we're also going to transition later on into prepaid items. Those are things that do recur, like your homeowner's insurance is going to be due every year, your property taxes, your mortgage insurance. But starting with closing costs, let's look at all of the things that are involved there. That's anything that you pay to your lender if you're paying any points, if you're paying an underwriting fee, if you pay for loan docs, a processing fee. So e, depending on the, the lender that you work with, on our end, we don't ever charge any of those fees. So you would only in box A of your loan estimate, that's where direct origination charges that are paid to the lender or the broker. In ours, most times that's empty at zero. Sometimes a borrower says they wanna pay points, points will show up in there. But if you're dealing with a lender that charges costs, all of that is going to be in box A of your loan estimate. So those are things that you pay to your lender. And when you're shopping for a loan, those are really what you're shopping for. Because when we get to box B and box C, those are items that you cannot shop for or items that you can shop for. Now, box B, what are typical closing costs, things that you cannot shop for? That's the credit report. It's the company that we use to pull credit. Um, the appraisal, things of that sort um, are things that you can't shop for. And as a result, those items in box B from your loan estimate also cannot vary. We didn't talk about the direct origination charges, anything that's paid to the lender or a broker that they disclose to you on a locked loan estimate those cannot change. There's zero tolerance. Well, box B is the same situation. If you can't shop for them, we have to disclose them accurately to you or we can't uh, charge any variance later on. So if we tell you your closing cost, uh, your credit report's going to be $25 and it ends up $125, we eat the extra $100 where we didn't disclose it accurately to you. No, understood. But let, let's, let's back up a moment because we're talking about a document called a loan estimate. When does a buyer, a, you know, someone going through the pre-approval process, talking to a lender, when do they see, I mean, like, when does this document present itself? Because I think it's so, important. Or, or can I just find one of these online? Like, how does this document show up? Absolutely. You can find one online and the CFPB actually has one on their website that we'll link in the show notes that gives you a walkthrough that answers every section. And they do a pretty good job of saying, what is this section? Why does it matter? And what should you be looking for? So, Back in the day, we used to have what was called a good faith estimate. It was pretty much a joke because you could put anything you wanted on there as a, as a lender. You could disclose whatever. And then when you get to close, if it's 100% inaccurate and every fee is three times what you disclosed, the borrower had no recourse. So post-2008, the government went back to the drawing board and said, how do we make sure that consumers are going to get an accurate estimate up front that the, that the lender is held accountable to at closing? 
So upfront, when we do a pre-approval, we may give you a loan estimate. Um, if a borrower wants it, what we often give people is a loan comparison that shows you a couple of different options and gives you the breakdown uh, of all of the costs that are gonna be listed on the loan estimate. And the reason for that is for your average consumer, it's a little bit easier to follow than the loan estimate. But for comparison purposes, the only thing you can be sure that if you wanna look at lender A versus lender B versus broker C, you need to get the loan estimate. And what it does is it sets tolerances for what can change throughout the process. So they're disclosing it to you. And again, items in box A can't change at all. Items in box B cannot change at all. Items in box C, those are things that you can shop for. They do have some tolerances and in certain situations could be a little bit higher than what you're getting disclosed. But the main purpose of this document is to get you an accurate number so you don't have a shocking dollar amount that you're being told to bring in at closing when we get to the end of the transaction. So for me, the most important thing as a lender that I'm doing for my clients is giving them an accurate estimate up front, whether it's a loan comparison, a loan estimate, a fee worksheet. We want you to know exactly what to expect at closing so that you're prepared and have the money that, that you need. Now, Jeb, you had mentioned something. When do you get it? Um, you can get this very early in the process, but it's not going to be super accurate until you have a property. So on your refinance, we can get you a very accurate loan estimate right up front. But Jeb has a client is out shopping and they make an offer on 10 different homes, anywhere from 600 to $750,000. Those are all going to look very different on a loan estimate, depending on where we end up on purchase price. And then also, are we locking the interest rate? Once you lock the interest rate is when everything in box A is, is set in stone. So again, if you talk to me in December and we're quoting you a rate that zero points and you come back now, we put a property in escrow in March, you either have the option of having a higher interest rate or paying points, a lot of points, to get that rate that you could have got in December. So that's where the lock comes into play. Until the rate is locked, the, the number of points required for any given interest rate are, are not set in stone. No, good. I mean, so that that's a good explanation of of the boxes on there and kind of what's involved. But let's go a little bit deeper here. So why do different lenders charge different amounts? Like if I go to you, why are your fees different than if I were to go to an online broker like a like a rocket mortgage or like, you know, one of the big box guys or for anyone for that matter? It's, it's really just business model. Everyone sets their own pricing and what they want profitability to look like. There's a wholesale price for interest rates in the market. And then every lender, mar mar <laughs> every lender marks those wholesale rates up to what they want their profitability to be. So some lenders, they don't want to say they're charging points, but they want a little extra profit in the file. So by doing that, they're going to say, well, we have a, a $495 underwriting fee. We have a three hundred dollar doc fee and a nine hundred and ninety five dollar processing fee so that ends up you know fourteen fifteen sixteen hundred dollars and on a three hundred three hundred fifty thousand dollar loan it's the equivalent to paying a half of a point so that's why you really want to look at everything in box a and just consider that a total it's being paid to the lender or the broker and whether it's points or whether it's additional fees you don't really care. It's This is what it's costing me to get that interest rate. And that's how you're gonna compare one lender to another to determine who's the cheapest. The cheapest is not necessarily the best. All reputable lenders should be in a pretty narrow range. That doesn't end up being the case. So that's why it's good to, to do a comparison. So you can kick out the guy that's telling you, you know, a quarter higher interest rate and, and $5,000 higher in fees is normal. The only way you would know that is by comparing it to one or two other lenders and seeing that there's there's better options. But if you shop with 10 lenders, eight of them are going to be in a fairly narrow range. We're competitive. We have very good pricing. We come in the low end of that range. But even at that, it's shocking to me when I see someone that is way out of the range. And some of those big box lenders that you talked about are the lenders that are at the high end of the range. They do a great job of marketing, of telling people, hey, we're the biggest lender in the country, JD Power rated number one. And yet when you look at their loan estimates, they're significantly higher than options of, of local lenders, local banks, local brokers. Right, so so on a purchase, box A are, are really the fees that the lender is charging. 
all the other boxes essentially are going to be the same across all brokers for the most part, right? Be well on a on a purchase the the lender whoever you're getting your loan from has no control over box C which is the biggest chunk box B uh, an appraisal is going to be pretty similar no matter what lender there no one's marking that up it's not a profit center credit report is a pass pass through cost I have to show the invoice of what it actually cost so the things that you can't shop for um, they're going to be pretty consistent from lender to lender. And in box C, Jeb, is where we get to on a purchase. That's going to be the same no matter what lender you go to. The items that you see in there are settlement charges or escrow charges, title fees, uh, recording fees, things of that sort that are either set by where you are in the country or decided in the contract that you negotiate with the listing agent when you're representing a buyer. No, got it. Okay. So if I'm a buyer and I'm looking at estimates, I should primarily focus on box A. That's what I'm Abs hearing. Ab absolutely. Because the okay. rest of the stuff is going to be very consistent and or dictated by the contract. Okay. So what if I'm I'm finding, uh, you know, I, I'm talking to a couple of different lenders and they're all charging me something in box A, for example, right? So they're charging me some points up front or some fees, some processing fees or whatever. Are those fees as a buyer, are those things I can negotiate with that lender or are they always going to be there? Do some lenders charge them? Some lenders don't. What's How, how does that get worked into the, the cost of, of, of buying a home? All, all of the above is correct. Everything is negotiable. Like on a daily basis, my job as a broker, we search pricing from over 150 different lenders. Now I don't work with all of those lenders, but I wanna see where the market is at. Now of the 20 or so lenders that we do work with on a regular basis, we're looking and seeing who has the best pricing. And on all of those loans, we're not charging those fees. So for us, we're putting our best foot forward every day in terms of, of what the pricing looks like. Now, if you go to a direct lender or if you go to your local bank and the, the bank teller that's doing the loan there says, well, here's what our rate is today and here are the fees that we charge. They're probably going to tell you they're not negotiable. But the, the reality is any lender that wants to get the loan can decide to cut their margin and make a little bit less money. So if you have a lender that has super not good pricing, they're out of the market, they're probably more likely to deal with you because they have so much margin built into that. If again, you call 10 different lenders and eight of them are in a super narrow range and you go back to all eight of them and say, hey, can you knock out this fee or can you knock $2,000 off? They're probably all going to say, this is where the market is at and this is where our profitability is at. Loans are expensive. The, the mortgage process, closing costs for purchasing a home, you look, it's thousands of dollars. So oftentimes consumers can look at that and go, these guys are making thousands of dollars off of me. At the end of the day, I haven't seen the numbers here recently, but profitability was huge in 2020 during COVID and lenders were making four to $5,000 net profit per closed loan. But it's gotten much tighter uh, over the last year and a half. And before COVID and the expansion of margins, lenders were down to making like $1,100, $1,200, $1,500 net profit on, on every deal. So yes, they can be negotiated in a tight market like we're in right now. There's not a ton of margin with a lender who has good pricing uh, and is a reputable lender to, to cut a whole lot of fees out. So they've set their pricing based off of what their overhead and their costs are. You're better off shopping among a couple different lenders and then finding who among the competitively priced lenders do you resonate with? Who do you, who is listening to you, asking the right questions, explaining things to you, and that you believe is going to manage the process for you to get to closing? Now, I know we still have to talk about prepaids, which are an additional piece of of the cost that you're going to pay when you when you buy a home or that are due. But let's let's take a minute here and and because these are common questions that people get or ask rather and can you finance these costs like what are there any out of pocket costs right i mean when am i i guess we're going to talk about all of this stuff but these are the things that come to mind is can you finance them let's let's say that let's discuss that up front so the the question has to be separated between a purchase and a refinance on a refinance you can absolutely finance your closing costs because you you already have equity built up in your home on a purchase, the only equity you're going to have in the property, so what determines the loan to value, is your down payment. So let's take an example where you're putting 5% down and you end up having $10,000 of total closing costs and prepaids at your purchase price. 
Well, if we finance those and we add it into the loan, you're no longer putting 5% down. You're putting 5% less that $10,000. So it's certainly possible to do it that way in terms of, of structuring the loan, but you're going to get the pricing for a 3% down loan, not the pricing for a 5% down loan. So it's not, it's not possible to just add it to the loan and still have get, get credit for the 3 or 5 or 10 or 20% down you are making. Got it. Okay. So now, so those are costs that are involved when I'm closing, right? So at the closing table, I'm, I'm bringing this money in, which we'll get into more detail and, and talk about. But how about as I'm in the process before closing, are there fees that I'm going to pay out of pocket as a potential home buyer? So there are lenders that, um, and it's generally the bigger online lenders that they would want to lock you in to the process as early as possible. So they'll get credit card information. They're going to charge you for the the credit report up front, so you wouldn't pay it at closing. Which again, that's not generally a really large charge for a single borrower. It's anywhere from twenty to thirty dollars, and for a married couple, anywhere from say thirty to fifty dollars. So not a huge deal. Um, some lenders do it. But what they're wanting to do is get that credit card and get an appraisal ordered as soon as possible. Again, that's an upfront charge. The appraisers are not going to go out and do the appraisal without getting paid. But there's an appropriate point in the process. And for us, for our purchases, we've already built a relationship with you. You're committed to us. We just pay for them upfront and collect at closing. And once or twice a year, we'll get burned and we'll eat a five or $600 appraisal. But it's the cost of doing business, keeping it relational, and also keeping things moving forward really quickly. But the, the answer to your question, the only things that you should ever be asked to pay prior to closing would be possibly the credit report and probably your appraisal. Now, I want to add on to that because we're, you're buying a house, right? As a real estate agent, there are some additional fees that you're going to pay outside of your, your closing costs that are associated with, with the mortgage side of things. And that's any inspections. So if you're buying a home, you know, you're going to have to pay that appraisal fee, which Josh mentioned upfront via credit card or what have you, cash or whatever, however they take the payment. But when buying a house and you're going through that home inspection phase, you're going to have to pay for that inspection up front. So if you get a home inspection, there, there's a fee associated with that. If you get additional inspections, say you get a, a sewer inspection or a mold inspection or any type of inspection on top of uh, the home inspection, typically there's a fee associated with that. And that's a fee that you're going to have to pay for out of pocket. So you got to be prepared in that sense. So if all of your money, for example, is tied up in, in some mo money market account that you can't access and you're looking to buy a home, you've, you've got to you know, have some cash on hand to be able to pay some of these fees up front or charge them to a credit card, which you can pay later. But just know that, you know, those are really the only two things I think that are going to come up in the process initially, Josh. Yeah. Am and right? and re relating those two items, Jeb, back to the loan estimate, um, if they're not on the purchase contract, they're certainly not part of our transaction right. on the mortgage. If they're not on the purchase contract, they're not going to end up on your, your settlement statement from escrow or your loan estimate um, or your closing disclosure at closing. So you're not really going to see them. They are closing costs. They're they're not actually a closing cost. They're a cost of the transaction. So it's important to be aware of that. One other thing, Jeb, and you can comment on this, but your your home warranty, depending on who's paying for the home warranty, that can be paid through closing and it can either go on the seller side if it's negotiated the seller's paying it in a really tight market like we're in right now. A lot of sellers are saying, no, pound sand, I'm not paying for that. And, and you are probably going to still agree to buy a home warranty and that will go on your side uh, of the loan estimate because that is negotiated in the contract 99 times out of 100. No, for sure. Um, and it's something I want to make a note of here too, as well, is that if you decide to get into escrow and you order an appraisal and you order a home inspection and you're in the process and for whatever reason you decide I'm not buying this home, those fees that you've paid to the appraiser, to the home inspector, they're gone. They're, they're, those are fees, the cost of doing business, if you will. And if you go decide again to put in another offer and buy another home, you're going to pay the same fees again. So you know, if you go through the process multiple times and, and back out or whatever happens and you decide not to move forward, you're going to have those fees multiple times. Whereas the closing costs that Josh is discussing here that we're talking in detail about, those are only going to be paid when you actually close on the property. So important note there, because I have seen multiple buyers go through the process 
get cold feet, change their mind, whatever, something comes up in an inspection, they don't want to move forward. Now they have to repay that fee again. So keep that in mind. Uh, Josh, prepaids. So we've, we've got an idea of closing cost, if you will. Now, a lot of people associate closing cost as is both the the non-recurring uh, side of things as well as the prepaid. So I'm, I'm often one of those people when I say closing cost, I'm talking big picture. I'm talking all of these fees. Your side, clearly you're not doing that because there's, you know, you're trying to um, show buyers where the fees are coming from and and what's actually, um, you know, part of, of, you know, the non-recurring versus the prepaids. But let's talk about prepaids. What, what are prepaids? How are they paid? Why are they involved in the process? So it, it's funny, Jeb, for us, it's much more of a discussion on refinances than it is on purchases, because uh, if someone decides to have an impound account and it requires $5,000 of total prepaids to get it set up, we'll send out an estimate on a refinance and the closing costs are $1,600 total. And we've told them that, and then they get it and they go, this says it's $6,500 where are you lying to me? What's going on here? So it's important for us to be able to explain, nope, those are prepaids. Prepaids uh, are recurring costs. We talked about how the closing costs are non-recurring. You are only incurring them because of getting a loan and or buying a home. Prepaids are costs of home ownership. So what are the things we're looking at? A big one at closing is prepaid interest. So if you are set to close escrow on the 20th of the month, the lender does not want a partial payment on the first of the next month. So people always talk about, cool, you get to skip a month's payment. You don't really. What happens, the 10 days that are remaining in the month in this example, or in another example, 15, 20, 25 days, however many days are remaining in the month, you're going to prepay those days of interest at closing. So that's one of the big prepaids there. You need to prepay your first year's homeownership, homeowner's insurance because a lender needs to know at closing that your insurance premium is paid and that thing's going to be insured for the next year. You also can have some prepaid homeowners association dues, a, a little bit of mortgage insurance can be collected. So those are our prepaids that everyone is going to have at closing that's sort of dictated by the lender and the transaction. There's also some items that are pre, uh, prepaid at closing or set to establish your impound account. So some loan programs say FHA requires an impound account. So what is uh, an impound account? An impound account is an account that goes along with your mortgage where you pay every month, not just the principal and interest on your mortgage, you're prepaying every month, one twelfth of your homeowner's insurance, your property taxes, mortgage insurance, any and all that additional stuff goes into this account. And then the lender pays it out for you uh, when your taxes come due. For us in California, your taxes are done twice a year. Some other states are once a year, and I'm sure there's probably one out there that does it more than twice a year but essentially they're collecting that one twelfth and they're paying it out for you. The vast majority of borrowers will choose to have an impound account just for simplicity's sake. There's not huge advantages to not having it. So uh, again, I would say at least 90% of our clients choose to have an impound account and you have to put additional money in there at closing to establish that impound account. And these amounts are going to vary by the month of the year. So we talked about you pay the first year homeowner's insurance, and we also talked about you're not gonna have a payment the first of the month when, when you close on that. So you're gonna put a couple of months extra uh, homeowner's insurance into that impound account so that after you've made 11 payments and it comes due in a year, there's plenty in there to, to pay the renewal. Now on the taxes, it's gonna depend on where we are in the year and when the taxes are due next. Sometimes it can be three or four months of taxes. At certain points in the year in certain states, it can be 10 or 12 months of taxes. So what you can see is this can be a large amount. You know, Jeb, we always get the question, well, I saw online it's three to 5% uh, I have to have for closing costs. How much is that? Or, or is that accurate? And, and we look at it and go, for us in California, especially for us at BuyWise, that generally box A is empty or very close to zero, you have, in terms of the closing costs, it's about 1% of the loan amount. On the prepaids, it's going to vary depending on the time of year, also about another 1%. So I would say your best case scenario at close is 2%. So 1% for, for closing costs, 1% for prepaids. 
Now, we didn't account for any points. If you chose to pay points, rates are a little higher. If you want to pay a point and get a quarter lower interest rate, that amount gets added on there. So you pay one point, now we're at 3%. Now, let's say you're using a lender that has a thousand or two thousand dollars of of lender fees call up 1500 bucks now we have you know another quarter percent or a half percent that we add in there you could easily be at three and a half percent and for us in california california is a relatively low closing cost state other states that use attorneys for closing you have attorneys fees in there um, you have uh, taxes that actually oftentimes the the buyer has to pay at closing so I think when you see these online numbers of three to 5%, it's someone trying to give a general answer that would be safe for everyone in the country. For us, typically about 2%. If you want to pay points, it can be two and a half, three percent 3%. Um, but if you use that three to 5% figure, especially if you're in a higher closing cost state, it kind of lets you know where what you're going to need to have on top of your down payment to cover both your closing costs and your prepaids. And, you know, kind of Jeb, back to your point, at the end of the day, buyers don't really care um, how it breaks down between closing costs and prepaids. They want to know the number. So when we review the loan estimate, we can tell you box A, B, C, D, and E are really closing costs. Um, F and G are, are going to be your, your prepaid items. And when you see that, it's a little bit easier to, to understand and know the difference between the two. Um, but it's not all closing costs, and it's certainly not all things that your lender controls. It's just part of the entire real estate transaction. No, good stuff. Um, so I so I have my down payment. Let's just say in this this case, I have a hundred thousand dollars down or fifty thousand, whatever the number is. And that's what I want to put down as my down payment. So I get the best interest rate associated with that down payment, if you will. And what if I don't have money for closing costs? What what if I don't have any additional money? Can I get it as a gift? Can I ask the seller to pay for it? Like where where can that money come from? So you, you mentioned something interesting and very foreign to us for the last several years. In uh, a more normal market, a balanced market where buyers have a, a little bit more leverage, you can absolutely ask the seller to pay your closing costs. Now, every loan program is gonna have limits on it, but for the most part, the limits are high enough that the seller can pay all of your closing costs, all your closing costs and all of your prepaids. So it's possible. Now, we've been in a crazy market the last couple of years. Jeb, when was the last time you saw a seller pay closing costs for a buyer? At least two years, maybe three or four? Not not in, in a way where they've asked for it up front occasionally, like if there's repairs or something involved instead of you know doing the repairs, the seller will, will gift an amount of money towards closing costs, which is, is, is for a whole different episode, if you will. Um, yep. but it, asking for it up front, it's been, it's been years. Yeah. I, I don't even, most, most agents just know it would be silly to even ask it. It would be, it would just be a way to get your, uh, your offer thrown Put into it the, the round file. <laughs> if it just goes to the trash. I don't even know it goes to the bottom, <laughs> but in terms of looking at that, um, so since that hasn't been an option the last few years, if you don't have it, what's the next option? we can get a lender credit. So why would the lender give you a credit? The lender's charging some of these costs and then there's third party costs. Why would they give me money to pay for it? Well, it's not because they're nice. It's because they just want a yield for, uh, for that loan. Meaning there's an interest rate any given day that they uh, is their targeted yield and it's known as a par rate. They don't charge you any points for it. They don't give you any lender credit for it. Now, if you need money, which a lot of our FHA buyers, for whatever reason, it's more uh, it's the lower the down payment, the more first time buyer, they're more interested in getting lender credit. So a lot of our FHA buyers, if you go up one, uh, a quarter percent in your loan amount, it's a rule of thumb. This isn't exact, but if you go up a quarter percent in your interest rate, you're going to get about a 1% credit for your closing costs, um, to use, to use for your closing costs or your prepaids. Sometimes we'll go up a half percent and you get 2%. And, and that allows most of our buyers to cover their closing costs and prepaids and get in with just their down payment. So that's definitely an option as long as you're not maxed at your debt to income ratio. So we have the wiggle room to increase the interest rate. Um, and it can be a really good option for getting in with less money. The other option, certainly what you said, Jeb, can you get a gift? Yep, absolutely. Gift funds can be used for closing costs on nearly every program. I'm sure there's one out there that you couldn't, but Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA, they're all going to uh, allow that. Um, the, the more likely option is, let's say the example that you have uh, $50,000 to put down and you're buying a $500,000 house. You might say, well, I've got 10%. 
Well, in reality, you're probably looking at a 5% down and you're using the rest of that money to cover your closing costs. And, and I say 5%, it doesn't mean you're going to back it all the way down to $25,000. Let's say your closing costs are $12,000. If you put $38,000 down on a $500,000 house, certainly more than 5%, but from the lender's perspective, it falls into the pricing bucket for both your interest rate and your mortgage insurance of a 5% down loan. So that's sort of all of the options and all of the ways that we can cover it. And and your, your options come down to how much money you have. Again, a lot of our FHA buyers, they're going to come in and say, I've got $18,000 total. And you're like, okay, in the price range you're looking, that's like 3.7%. Well, I know they have their 3.5% down payment. They don't have any extra money. So when we're setting up their file and telling them what they qualify for, we're setting it up with a max lender credit um, and knowing that's going to determine their maximum purchase price because we can't get them the best interest rate. We got to give them the best lender credit at the lowest rate possible. No, good. I mean, really good explanation. I mean, what I hear here is that here, here, you get that. Um, what what I'm hearing is that it's important. Again, last last episode we talked about pre-approval versus pre-qualification. In a pre-qualification, you're not going to get the detail that you are in a pre-approval where you actually see the fees that are associated. You, you know, get a, you, you know, your handheld, if you will, and walk through the process and, and have this discussion in detail. That's why you need, if you're thinking about buying a home, you need to have that conversation with the lender. And last, you know, episode, when we talked about it, we said, you know, how soon can you start that process? Well, you should start it as soon as you're thinking about buying a home, if it's six months out, eight months out. And the reason for that is because you can have the conversation like we're having here saying, hey, look, you need the down payment, but you also need this, you know, this additional amount of money, which you might not have saved or have known about without having that conversation. So I think it's important to talk to a lender, um, you know, early in the process so that you know exactly, you know, how much money you're probably going to need. It's not going to be exact, but a, a really good estimate of, of what it's going to cost to buy that home. And if you're, you know, Again, I heard Josh mention something about points, paying points. What are points? You know, how do we differentiate one lender from another when they're talking about buying down the rate and paying fees to do it and all of that? Next episode, we're going to dive into points. So tune in next week when we take a deep dive into the discussion on points, why you should consider them, why maybe it's not a good idea. We're going to get Josh to give us a detailed explanation of points his theory on paying them. So tune in when we take that dive. We'll see you then.